Thanks, Louise. You told me you wouldn't use that after all. So, um, yeah, ju just, just before we g get into what I was mainly going to say, I should just draw your attention to the fact we've had over 400 people here today. Yeah. Which, is more than, which is more than double the previous conferences we had in 2016. And I think reflects exactly that the concerns of people are around the issues that we've tried to address in this conference and we hope you're all taking away new ideas, new approaches uh, to actually strengthen that fight. Because what you can get with a demonstration is obviously much more numbers. What you can get in a conference is actually meeting with each other, seeing the scale of support of people who are really committed enough to come to an event like this and actually get involved as activists and campaigners. And that's really important. This is gold dust. Because we can do things nationally, but if we don't follow them up and build real strong local and regional networks that are going to really make a difference, then our campaign is not going to do what it's supposed to do. So it's really important and really thank you so much for all of you that have come today and participated uh, so positively in this conference. And for those that want to take it further and be involved in the decision making and, and deciding where Health Campaigns Together goes in, into the next year, I urge you to affiliate to Health Campaigns Together. Our next affiliates meeting is the 2nd of December. And so you can be part of that if you affiliate any time now. And we're throwing in a special offer. If you affiliate now, you can get 2018 as part of the, the deal. An extra, an extra two months free. How's that? So uh, a special deal. All, all the arrangement, all the uh, uh, um, login details, everything on the website. Uh, just to join us. Click the, the, the thing and it's all there. Okay, and just finally, oh, the other point is all the workshop discussions where, where notes were taken will be circulating those and certainly some of the uh, proposals coming out of the workshops will be taking on board as officers and at the next affiliates meeting as to how we shape and take forward the work of health campaigns together. So I wanted to start with a lot of the actual main content of what I'm saying by talking about fake news. Fake news, fake news. Well, we know somebody pretended to have invented fake news. Never apparently have I heard of faking it before. Donald Trump uh, came up with this phrase and he keeps using it. But who are the main proponents of it here? Well, step forward, Jeremy Hunt. Step forward, step forward, the valiant crew of the Department of Health press office, okay? Who, who flout every basic principle of public relations journalism by constantly pumping out material they know to be deceptive, one-sided, and not answering any of the questions they're supposed to be answering. Public relations executives are supposed to be actually facilitating information, passing on information, all the uh, ethical guidelines of the profession when it first started was that they had to tell the truth at all times. Never tell a lie. A lie will get found out. How many times have they been found out giving false figures? Jeremy Hunt, the Department of Health, all these people rolling out figures that are complete fantasy. And actually they're now in complete disconjunction, the Department of Health figures, and they always have the same reaction. We don't recognize these figures. We've put an extra 10 billion pounds in. The NHS has got more money than ever before. It's always the same reaction, and it doesn't matter what question is raised. But actually, the reality is they've never been more exposed that all these figures really bear very little relation to reality. And we're now getting a completely different version of reality being put forward by NHS England, NHS providers, NHS Confederation, individual NHS managers for the first time in my recollection, people who are remaining in post as NHS managers actually coming out critical about the state of play within the NHS. I've never seen that before. Occasionally you get a statement made by somebody thrown over their shoulder as they move off to some well-paid job outside the NHS or retire, but I've never seen serving NHS, we've had four chief executives in the last week tweeting about the dire state of play in their trusts and their inability to make, make do with the budgets that are available. So this is the real news that's coming out. The real news uh, of the cuts and the closures. The fact we're 8,000 beds fewer than we were in 2010 when we go into this winter. 8,000 acute beds short plus the thousands of mental health beds that have cut since that period of time. We have fewer frontline beds, but we have four million more people and we have a large number more older people. 
We have half a million people at least are denied care now compared to their social care than they were back in 2010. Whereas in fact, of course, the level of demand and the, the, the numbers demanding care are actually continue to increase. And of course, we've had the freeze on funding. They haven't actually technically cut funding, but they have just held it a fraction above inflation for the last seven years, while in fact the costs have gone up 4% a year, and that's the growing gap that we see. That's the gap that we're supposed to bridge, apparently, by social uh, so STPs and various other uh, acronyms and plans and so forth uh, to cut back services to meet the available resources. So that's the reality. We've got the staffing gaps, unprecedented and growing staffing gaps. We've got the massive exit of European trained professional staff on whom the NHS has depended so strongly. Thousands of them leaving because of the Brexit vote, because the country and the NHS have become less, well the NHS possibly not, but the country as a whole less welcoming and their futures are insecure. They're leaving, they're not being replaced. We've had the bursaries cut and, and, and cutting the flow of new trainees into the system. A big reduction in mature students applying for nursing and other professional uh, training roles. We've had the cut, as was mentioned this morning, in the numbers of GPs and doctors signing on for training and coming on stream. The difficulties recruiting GPs, the huge staffing gaps of consultants. We've got all that telling now into the performance figures, the, every, every, virtually every performance measure, the NHS falling back. That's the real news. That's what's actually really happening on the ground. We've got the PFI, the figures released just recently in the, uh, in, in the, in the report recently that showed the billions that have been milked out in profits, largely into tax havens by PFI. As the government is pushing now more schemes, they're headed towards PFI because there's no public sector capital available for any of the schemes that managers want to carry out. So they're saying, and we just, in, in Huddersfield, where the fight, fight is going on for the Royal Infirmary, they're now saying there's no other money available, so it's got to be PFI. We've got a catastrophically expensive PFI we're already paying through the nose for, but we're going to get another one for the extension that's going to go on that same hospital in order to replace the Huddersfield Royal Infirmary. So PFI, none of the lessons have been learnt by this government, certainly, although it does seem to be something of a change of heart from John McDonnell and the Labour Party on PFI, although exactly where all the money is going to come from to actually bring them all back into public ownership is another question. This is one of the most cosmically expensive mistakes that's ever been made, if we kindly regard it as a mistake. So there's more real news though, there's more real news which is also there that the private sector that has been brought in very expensively through the Health and Social Care Act offered contracts and continues to play a, a role uh, leeching off the NHS at various levels, the private sector, many of these contracts are failing. They're failing because there's not enough money in the pot to guarantee the profits and the private sector not seeing the profits are packing up and leaving, leaving things in the lurch, just walking away, just walk away. Hospital cleaning, doesn't matter, we can't make a profit, we're walking away. Just leave the NHS to take back over again. Hospital management at Hinchingbrook, we can't, we can't be doing with that, it doesn't make a profit, walk away. Leave it, leave it dangling in the air. The public, the private sector do, doing this time and again. Pa patient transport services, massive, massive scandal up and down the country. This, this, is a, this is a really big issue. This is the real news. This is what's really going on in the NHS. And of course the other real news that don't, people don't necessarily pick up on a lot of the STPs are completely stalled. Why are they stalled? Because the government is stalled. The government has no majority to drive through a lot of the really unpopular changes that a lot of the STPs hinge upon. So they're stood there treading water and new ideas are brought forward. Accountable care organisations, which of course are not accountable, don't care and aren't very well organised. <laughs> the acronym of the year. But the reality is that actually things are moving, not in the way that maybe the government expected. We've got huge retreats on cuts and closures. These are very important. We've had them discussed today in Devon, North Devon, the retreat on the, on the, on the North Devon Hospital, extremely important. The, the retreat in South End and, and Chelmsford over the closure, rundown and downgrading of their a and E's, extremely important campaigns because they're both in Tory areas where Tory MPs were put under the heat and Tory MPs had to intervene. This is really important lessons for us. We've got, as I said, managers speaking out. We've got NHS providers who have been running this campaign since the beginning of the year, a relentless campaign. They're saying we cannot deliver on the money you're giving us. It's mission impossible. 
and they're really hard hitting. And Chris Hopson, you see on the radio, and t here on the radio, see on the TV, and other um, uh, 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 leading people from NHS providers actually leading the charge from the management side. This is not the Department of Health speak. They've got their own agenda as providers trying to deliver a service within the NHS. The NHS Confederation, with social care providers, with medical royal colleges, wrote a letter the other week, uh, just a week or so ago, uh, to, to, to the government. We cannot survive on this, writing to Philip Hammond. We want more money in the November budget. November budget, let's remember, there's a budget coming up. If we can pile any pressure on locally to get MPs to pile more pressure on Philip Hammond between now and November 22nd, let's do so. We've got... Even the think tanks, you know, which are quite often misnamed, but are starting to think. We've got the, Nuff, the Nuffield Trust and the Health Foundation have started to come up with reports that are really quite hard-hitting, uh, critiquing these various proposals, the STPs, the ACOs and whatever, critiquing the possibility of de deliver, delivering them with no staff, no funding, no capital under these conditions. Even the King's Fund, right, the Uncle Tom King's Fund and all, have suddenly discovered there's a crisis going on, there's a gap in nurse staffing and so on. Even the King's Fund has started to speak out. The mood is changing. And where is anybody now defending competition in the market, right? That was the great orthodoxy a couple of years ago. Now suddenly the whole thing is how do you actually build these big contracts, these big footprints, uh, accountable care organizations, which actually eliminate local competition, have one big contract to, for the whole lot. It, it's important because all these things were there absolutely in stone a couple of years ago and suddenly nobody wants to defend them anymore. No managers are speaking to that agenda. The thinking is changing. And so we've now got a situation where also the Labour Party has changed, as we saw from John Ashworth. I think you could see there all the imprints of someone who's been very heavily lobbied for quite a long time, okay? In a, in a good way, in a good way, right? He's responded. He's listened, he's responded. It's in line with the, the thinking of other members of his shadow health, the, shadow health team, the shadow team, but it's still important. Now, if we can get that impact there, we should draw strength from that. We should go and pass some pressure on some other Labour politicians who need to speak out and move along a bit, and we need to also pile the pressure on the Tories. Because I tell you what, if a Tory party's got an average age of 71, how many people can they afford to leave lying on trolleys over the winter time without paying a price? We might celebrate the fact that Maggie, uh, Maggie May, Maggie May, uh, uh, Theresa May, Theresa May is killing, killing off, killing off her own supporters. But I mean, it's, it's bad ethics, as, as Gajinder Singh is saying. Let's put the patient at the centre, even if it's a Tory. Okay, let's have a campaign. This is a campaign for the NHS for all of us. Okay, there is no private sector A and E. It doesn't matter if you've got boop health insurance or whatever it is. You are struck down in the street. You have a cardiac arrest. You have a stroke. You're taken you become frail and elderly, nobody in the private sector is remotely interested in looking after you. Zippo, nothing. You die. So anybody saying the rich can opt out of this, well, to some extent they might think they can, but there's no way out. If they kill off the NHS, they are killing off people and they're killing off the possibility of accessing these services. So the reality is they won't completely kill the NHS, they'll just reduce it to the state that people who can afford to will pay for private insurance. That's the big way in which the private sector is hoping to cash in on this. And the only people making money out of it at the moment in the private sector are the private hospitals, filling beds that will otherwise be empty because hardly anybody's got private health insurance, people paying cash, and NHS-funded patients using the beds because the NHS beds have already closed. That's what's going on in the private hospitals, and that's where the money's being made. Now, we can stop it. We've shown we can stop it. We changed the mood with March the 4th, as Sam quite correctly said. It influenced the election. It's part of the reason we've got a weak and wobbly government. Now, Theresa might be wobbly, but she's no weeble, okay? We push her hard enough, she'll fall over, right? Jackie, ja Jackie Berry pointed out, we've got to push till they fall over, okay? In the process, we might defend a force some retreats, but we have to push because this government is throttling the life out of our NHS. This cash squeeze cannot continue. We cannot tolerate another cash squeeze until 2021, and then beyond if, they get, if anybody survives that long, right? We can't have it. We have to have action now. And all the issues that we've been talking about, 
and it's overwhelming actually the registration for, we did a little sample of the people logging in for the conference what were people concerned about cuts and stps was overwhelming it's almost half the, the initial quota of people applying were all saying they wanted to go to that one workshop so we had to in the end split it into two it was enormous and and this clearly is the concern because people might not understand what an ACO is, they might not be able to make head or tail of what their STP says, and quite often they're right because it doesn't say very much, and these plans are really badly written, and in general were written to satisfy NHS England rather than go forward. Okay? You might not understand the complexities of the Naylor report, but you understand that if you squeeze and squeeze the resources and you drive the staff away and you don't fill the vacancies and you reduce the staffing levels, people are going to die from rotten care, people are going to die because there's no beds, people are going to die stuck in the back of ambulances waiting for to get into car parks. That's the situation. We can't allow that to happen. And that's why we do need the demonstration or demonstrations next year, whichever, we do need to, to join in and to build demonstrations at local level, at national level, and we need a network of local campaigns that are going to pile pressure on every local politician we can think of. And don't let the councillors off the hook. The councillors who are conniving at this stuff must be forced to step up and stand up for their local population, a stand up for healthcare, and no longer have any truck with these wretched STPs, ACOs, and the various other formulations that are actually killing off our NHS. There's nothing to be gained for local government out of that. The STPs are not interested in solving the problems of local government. They have no proposals to solve the problems of local government. The cash gap stays unresolved. No money is coming from the NHS, right? So get them on our side. We've seen two councillors this morning lead off who are actually leading, uh, part of leading the charge to defend local hospitals. We want every council leader to be let, fighting for local hospitals. We want every council to be taking the side of local people. And we should be pressing and campaigning for that. Whether there are local elections this next coming year, we need to be on the case there. We can do this. We can build a movement. We saw on March the 4th, we can build a big movement. We can build a bigger movement this next March. We can build a bigger movement again in July. We have to keep on going until we win because we don't have a choice. We've only got one NHS. We can't let it go. Okay, let's keep make a stand here. The rot stops here. The fight starts here. We're stepping up another gear. And if Theresa May thinks she's got to wait with it till the end of the year, she might have another thing coming in the new year. Let's go for it. Let's fight for it. We can win it. Thank you very much.